13, the King James text today reads, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is, the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Did you hear me, LGBT believer? Oh, yeah. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Paul doesn't quote Franklin Graham. Oh, Paul doesn't quote Jimmy Swaggart. Paul doesn't quote Pat Robertson. Paul quotes the scriptures. You need to have your confidence today, not in what some preacher says, but what the scriptures say. And the scriptures say, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Woo! That's enough for you to get in a shouting spell right there. Verse 12. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Look now. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. Not just call on the Lord but call on the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Well, if you're going to call on his name, that means you've got to know, he, know his name. Well, we're going to talk about that in a minute. I must confess is my topic this afternoon. If you bow your heads with me a moment. Master, we love you, God, and we thank you, Lord, for the wonderful, refreshing sense that we feel in your presence at this hour. What a marvelous, marvelous time we've had singing the great songs of the church. Oh God, every time I think about heaven, my hope is renewed. Every time I think about that day, that glad day, that marvelous jubilee, when we're all going to be gathered up together in the air to meet with our King, our Lord, our Savior. Master, our righteousness, our hope, our power. Oh God, I get excited. And Lord, right now the Word of God must go forth and for whatever reason, reasons I cannot say I understand. But my body is going through quite the battle, quite the struggle. But Lord, I've made a commitment to you that as long as there is breath in my body, as long as I have the strength, God, to get in this altar, even if I have to sit down on a chair, even if I have to lay in a bed, I'm going to keep preaching until I draw my last breath or until you come, one. Master, today I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. There is no preacher on this planet who understands better the concept of the anointing. Lord, without the anointing, we are a sounding brass or tinkling cymbals. We're just noisemakers. But God, with the Holy Ghost anointing, all of a sudden the words that the preacher preaches come to life in the heart and in the spirit and in the hearing of every believer who is hearing and Lord, it brings life and hope and salvation and healing and deliverance to those who are so desperately in need of these things. I pray, God, today that your word would bring salvation. I pray today, God, that it would bring healing. I pray, God, it would bring deliverance to those who are captive and bound. 
Oh, Master, anoint your servant today. I so greatly need it. And touch every ear that our heart might be receptive, that our spirit might be open to receive that which the Spirit would speak unto the church. We ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated today. Praise God. Paul the Apostle in the book of Romans is writing to believers. He is not writing to unbelievers. See, we love, I'm telling you, Baptist folk and Assembly of God folk and Church of God folk and Four Square Gospel folk. They just love to take the writing of Scripture, uh, of God's Word, out of context. Paul was not writing, Bill, to unbelievers. He was not writing to those who had not yet received the gospel and obeyed the gospel. No, he was writing to those who had already believed. He was writing to those who had already been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. He was writing to those who had already received the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the initial evidence of speaking with other tongues. These people had already repented. They had already turned their lives to God. But he's writing to them in the 10th chapter of the book of Romans and he is saying to them, don't you folks understand? Don't you remember what it takes to keep you on the highway of holiness? Don't you understand what it takes to keep you on the pathway to glory? You see, what Paul wrote in Romans 10 does not tell you how to be saved. It tells you how to stay saved. Hallelujah. It doesn't tell you how to come into the church and how to obey the gospel. It tells you what what you must do to continue in that gospel. Once you have already repented, been baptized, received the Holy Ghost, once you've obeyed this full gospel message, there is something you yet need to do. And Paul said, it is simple. It is on the tip of your tongue. You can tell me this quickly what you must do. You can tell me this quickly because you know it. It's in your heart. It's on the tip of your tongue. That is if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. End of story, period. You can try to put all the additional requirements you want to put on. You can tack on all the works of the law you want to try to tack on. You can put in all the man-made dogma and all the man-made doctrine you want to try to add to this. But my Bible tells me if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. End of story, period. I got news for you. There is not one requirement in there today that an LGBT believer cannot meet. There is no reason in there today that someone who is part of our communities cannot get in this boat and stay in this boat. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You know, sometimes when you get in a boat, there are rules, there are things you got to do to stay in the boat. Now, I don't know about you, but I've ridden in a few boats in my day. And there are some boats you get in and they'll tell you, remain seated. Hello now. Remain seated, because if you don't, you may find yourself in the drink. Come on now. You may find yourself back in the water. Once God saved you, He don't want you to wind up back in sin. He doesn't want you to wind up back in the world. He wants you to remain seated. So once you get in the boat, by following the full gospel message, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall I receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Once you're on that boat, remain seated. Because you don't want things to get rough and you to fall overboard and find yourself right back in the water where God saved you from. Hello now. 
Remaining seated is a simple thing. All you got to do is confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. You see, you got to be able to tell the world He is Lord of your life. There are no such things as silent Christians. There are no such thing as secret followers of Christ. You see, in the Lord's day, there were some who followed him secretly, Lisa. You remember Nicodemus who came to the Lord at night? He was under the cover of night because he was the follower of the Lord, but he didn't want everybody to know. And then there was a rich fellow. When Jesus was crucified on the cross, this rich man came and said, Hey, I'll give you my tomb, which I've paid for. I'll give you my resting place that I have had carved from the side of a rocky mountain. And I'll let you lay his body to rest in my grave. I'm going to tell you, in that era, Joseph of Arimathea, the Bible tells us he too was a secret follower of Christ. I'll tell you, back in those days, you give somebody your burying spot, you've given them something. Because it took a lot of effort. Most folks are lucky if they could be buried underground. Most folk are lucky, seriously, if they could be dug up, a hole dug, and their body lowered into a hole. A lot of people in biblical times were discarded like trash. There was actually a place where they used to take bodies and burn them. They would just throw them on the pile and burn them. And that is a place that is likened unto another place we call hell. That doesn't mean hell don't exist because this place, no. It means that it is likened. It, you know, it's like somebody saying, boy, it's hot as hell out here today. Well, it isn't really hot as hell, but you're making your point. Well, when people say, you know, Gahana, this is like, you know, uh, hell is like this, you know. Well, what they're talking about is there's a fire that just keeps burning and burning and burning. never goes out because there's always something more to throw on it. Well, I won't tell you. You cannot be a secret believer. If you're going to stay on the boat, you've got to be willing, you've got to be able, you've got to be ready to speak and confess Jesus Christ before a lost and unsaved world. I'm going to tell you, when as hostile as the world is becoming toward Christianity, and unfortunately, I've been preaching this for so many years, folks, long before I came into affirming ministry, I'm serious, Long before I came into affirming ministry, I preached that fundamentalists and evangelicals were driving Christianity to a very bad place. And they were making our reputation terrible. And they were creating a horrible reputation for anyone who identifies as a born-again, spirit-filled child of God, a Christian. If you say that Christ is Lord of your life today, many people look at you like you're crazy. They look at you like you're off balance. You know, something's wrong with you. Because, well, science and technology and advancements have brought us to the place where we know that uh, faith and religion is all just a bunch of bunk. Well, it may be a bunch of bunk to you, but it's worked for me. And if I close my eyes in death tomorrow, honey, you can believe I've ceased to exist all you want to. I believe I'm going to see Jesus, and I'm looking forward to it. Amen. So you believe what you want to believe. I'll tell you what I know. I know I'm going to realize what I have envisioned. I'm going to realize what I believe. Because the scripture says, uh, according to your faith, so be it unto you. So if I can believe with all my heart that I'm going to make heaven and I'm going to see Jesus and I'm going to see great grandma and I'm going to see my grandma and my grandpa and I'm going to see my aunts and uncles and people I've loved and people I've adored in this life, then honey, according to my faith, so be it unto me. I'm going to see it. We must confess. The title of my message today, I must confess. You know, when someone holds a conviction, when they hold the truth in their heart so dearly, when truth is more important to them than the repercussions of declaring that truth. There are people who will walk into a police station 
And they will say, you know, this crime that was committed here and you're looking for the perpetrator. You're looking for the individual who committed this crime. Well, I must confess. I murdered that individual. I robbed that bank. I stole from that person. I broke into that home. I stole that car. I must confess. What are you doing? Are you just getting out there and saying something to be saying something? No. No, you're speaking from the deepest inward part of your heart. And you're declaring a truth that you know. That you know. And in spite of whatever repercussions might come, you confess. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? I must confess. You know what? If people want to laugh at me because I say I'm a Christian, laugh. People want to look at me like I'm a dope because I believe in Jesus. Go ahead and laugh. It don't bother me no kind of way. It don't, don't bother. My relationship with God has worked for 53 years. And you know what? You just have a party and you laugh and you get a chuckle out of it all you want to. I must confess. And if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Now here's the tricky part, because see, confession with our mouth, that relates to how we relate with other human beings. When you confess with your mouth, human beings are listening, our parents are listening, our grandparents are listening, our families are listening, our friends are listening. But then there's another part to this. And believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. You know what cracks me up about these fundamentalists and evangelical churches that are running around just causing so much havoc in the world today? They are filled with people who confess Christ, but don't believe in their heart that God hath raised him from the dead. You see, you can easily say, I believe in Jesus. You can easily go to church. You can easily take communion. You can easily participate in the religious exercises of your given denomination. The tricky part is God ain't fooled by your actions. Because he knows what's going on in here. So it's not good enough, Martin, to simply confess. You've got to believe. And you got to believe it in your heart. What do you have to believe? You have to believe that God hath raised Christ from the dead. Mmm. My word. Lisa, this isn't about getting on the boat. But it's telling you how to stay on the boat. Please stay in your seat. When you get on the airplane, that stewardess gets up there. I'm going to sound mean for a minute just because I'm in a mean mood. Blame it on not feeling so well. Man, they got some ugly stewardesses nowadays. I remember when I was a kid, it seemed like every stewardess was a supermodel. Now some of them are super cows. I mean, they get up there on the... This is your stewardess. Please watch me while I show you our safety features of this plane you're riding on. And I'm looking at her and I'm thinking, oh dear Lord, sister, please, please sit on the other side of the plane to kind of counterbalance things, you know. When I was a kid, stewardesses had to be spelt, you know, they had to be lightweight, safe gas. Now some of them boogers, I mean to tell you, they burn more gas carrying the stewardess than they do the passengers. Anyway, I just had to say that. I have to get a little chuckle out of y'all. You know, got to give you a little bit of comic relief. That stewardess get on the plane and say, now here are the safety features of this ba -ba 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 jet that you're riding on. Your when the light comes on, please remain in your seat with your seat belt fastened. Am I telling the truth? It is against federal law for anyone to light up a cigarette and smoke on an airplane, not only in the cabin, but also in the bathroom, blah, 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 blah. Right? Am I telling the truth? Now, that ain't the stewardess telling you how to get on the plane, but that's the stewardess telling you how to stay on the plane. Because if you don't follow the rules, you're going to wind up off the plane. Am I telling the truth? 
Yeah, or if you don't follow the rules, you might wind up injured. I've gone through some turbulence. My goodness, have mercy. If you were standing up when that plane started bouncing around, you literally knocked your brains loose on the, on the top of the plane. Because that thing comes down. I, I flew one time with a pilot next to me. And the pilot, matter of fact, it was the second time I ever flew. And I was so grateful for this man because of him, I've never been afraid of flying ever since he sat beside me. Because he literally, Martin, would explain to me everything. As we, he was in a uniform, he was going home. And I told him, I said, this is my second time flying. And the last time I flew, I left my fingerprints in the armrest. <laughs> And he said, because I, I used to be, as a kid, man, I was terrified of heights. And if I looked out that window, Johnny, I'm telling you what, I was about ready to throw up my guts. I mean, I, I don't want to see all that out there. You know, let me just sit here and act like I'm on a roller coaster, which scares me enough. I don't ride roller coasters. I don't get on rides that go up in the air. I don't like heights. I don't like heights. Well, this... This pilot was so nice, he explained everything to me, everything, as we went. And when the plane started bouncing around and turbulence, you know, of course me, I'm getting nervous. And he said, oh, he said, you know what, that is low pressure pockets of air that the plane literally passes through. He said, you would not believe it. He said, I'm not trying to scare you, but listen, do you know when you go, you feel the plane doing this? He said, we are moving so fast that what that plane is actually doing at times, he said, is dropping anywhere from 20 to 50 feet. And yet, because you're moving so fast forward, it just feels like this. But in reality, Martin, you're going like this, you know, but you're going like this, you know, so fast forward. And he said, but don't be afraid, don't be nervous. He said, planes are built in such a way he said all of this is taken into account when they build the plane he said there's a certain amount of flexibility just like a bird you know he said uh, you can't build it rigid he said if you build it rigid it's going to break he said have you ever been in a skyscraper and i said yes sir he said well skyscrapers are built so that they actually have lean that as the wind and the Air currents pass them. They actually lean a couple inches this way and a couple inches that way. And he said, but they have to build them that way because if you build it too rigid, it'll break. So therefore, it has to have a little bit of give. You have to have a little bit of give. He said, well, planes are built the same way. They've got the give. So when they experience this, it just gives a little and it, everything keeps flowing right along. Well, I've never been afraid to fly ever since then. But I know when the stewardess gives her little speech, I know what she's saying are things that are going to keep me safe and keep me in my place on that plane. Am I telling the truth? All right? It's not about getting on the plane. I don't need to know that I need to wear my seatbelt till I'm on the plane. Hello now. Because if I run around telling everybody in the world, oh, if you ever go flying, you need to wear a safety belt. Well, that person may never get on a plane a day in their life. So you just give them information, don't matter, no way, no how. No, you need to tell the people who are on the plane what they need to do to be safe while they're on this plane. That is what Roman 10 is. It is God letting the church know, listen, once you get in this ship, once you get in the lifeboat, once you've reached out and accepted and embraced and obeyed the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, this is what you have to do to keep your place. And it's simple. All you've got to do is keep your faith intact. I'm going to tell you, when I, when I come out some years back, it's been a long time now, Martin, my faith never changed. I still believe Jesus was who Jesus said he was. I still believe Jesus did everything he said he did. I still believe that the Lord died to save me. I still believe he physically rose from the dead on the third day. I still believed everything I ever believed. 
That's why when I came back, I didn't come back to a watered down, uh, you know, convoluted, polluted doctrine. No, I came right back to what I left because I knew I knew what I knew when I left was the same thing I knew that I knew when I came back. Hello now. I still had to live right. I still had to act right. Not to be saved, but to be a witness. Because God's looking for a witness. He's looking for us. He don't want us to get on the boat and then selfishly like so many of the survivors from the Titanic. Okay, I'm on the boat now. Let's get as far away as we can from this sinking ship. What about the other people in the water? Don't worry about them. Let them be. Hello now. No, 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 no. That's what a lot of Christians do. They don't worry, Martin, about living a Christian life. They don't worry about being a testimony. They don't worry about being a witness. Well, the only problem is when you do that, you're driving your lifeboat out while there are still people dying in the water. You're supposed to be there to help rescue them. Jesus is the life preserver. All you got to do is throw the life preserver out to them. Hello now. And then the church reels them in. <laughs> the church pulls them in. And I tell them the truth. That's what, we're, that's what we're called to do. So yeah, we're called to be a witness. We're called to live a godly life and uh, to be a testimony, to be a light shining in a dark world. But if we're going to be saved, the requirements are simple. You've got to confess. You can't keep your faith in Christ a secret. There are no secret Christians. You can't keep it quiet. You can't say, well, you know, I, I just won't mention that. That I have a relationship with the Lord. Uh, why? Are you afraid of the repercussions? People confess to crimes knowing good and well they're going to go to jail for the rest of their lives. People confess to crimes knowing good and well they may wind up with a, a uh, shot in the arm that's going to take their life. Am I telling the truth? They're aware of the repercussions, but at the same time, they feel the compulsion to confess because they know that there's no justice without confession the family who lost a member the family who lost a loved one to a murder Johnny they'll never have peace they'll never have rest until that crime has been accounted for and someone has taken responsibility and justice has been served am I telling the truth so we need confession we need somewhere along the line we need somebody to pay the price for that crime and that person knows when they confess that there are repercussions. Why in the world do we Christians think that we can get away with, well, I'll just keep my faith quiet because I'm afraid of the repercussions. You remember anything the Lord said about being ashamed of Him before men? My word have mercy. Confession in the Greek, the word we read in Romans 10, confess or confession, comes from a Greek word, homologio. I probably didn't pronounce it altogether right. It's Greek to me. <laughs> this is a word that is defined in the following manner. To say the same thing as another. In other words, to agree with or to assent. To concede, meaning not to refuse or to promise. Not to deny. To confess, declare. To confess, or in other words, to admit or declare oneself guilty of what one is accused of. It means to profess, to declare openly, to speak out freely. To profess oneself the worshiper of one. To praise or celebrate. It don't take people very long to find out I'm a child of God because I ain't ashamed of it and I don't have no problem, no way mentioning it. It comes up in casual conversation. I, I walked into the uh, Lowe's here a while back. I told you the story. They give me, uh, and uh, I'd done an order online and when I went to pick it up, I brought it home, and I couldn't find one of the items that was part of my order. So I went back to the store. I said, whoops, y'all forgot part of my order. And they said, oh, well, we're sorry. And they give me what, I, what they had forgotten, which was a bunch of, uh, of uh, lock nuts, I believe it were, lock uh, washers. And then I went home, and I'm searching through some stuff. And lo and behold, I found out they had mixed the lock washers with the bolts that I had ordered. But I didn't know that. 
So now I had the ones that ordered, plus I had the free ones that gave me to replace the ones that I thought I didn't have. So I went back to the store. I said, oh, well, I'll keep them. It'll be easier. I went back to the store, and I picked up one of the, the washers that I had been given to replace the ones I thought I didn't have, but I did. And I went to the cash register with my order, and I told the young lady at the cash register, I said, honey, do me a favor. Ring me up 20 of these. And she's looking at me kind of funny. And I said, no, just bring up 20 of these. I said, and then you keep this one and put it back in stock. Well, it's easier to put one back in stock than 20. You know, I didn't want them. So I, I, said, you know, I said, and let me tell you what happened. So I told her. She said, do you know you're the first person that I've ever heard do anything like this? I've never heard anybody come back and tell us that that we give them twice, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I looked at her, I said, sweetie, I'm a Christian, I'm a child of God, and I'm obligated to do this. Do you follow what I'm telling you? I want people to know that the reason I'm doing the right thing is because I belong to Him. Amen. Amen. I'm not just doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do. I'm doing the right thing because I'm one of His. And if I'm one of His, then it is incumbent upon me to do the right thing. Am I telling the truth? Amen. So my faith is something I'm happy to talk about. The last thing in the world you want to do is get into it. Talk to me about Jesus, the Bible, the Word of God. Talk to me about the blessings of God because you know as well as I do that we're going to talk all night. I don't have a problem one talking about the Word of God. I don't have a problem one talking. That's one thing I love about my family. Bless their hearts. They may be a bunch of imperfect people and we I might have come from a bunch of dysfunction, but as far as our faith was concerned, honey, there was nothing we liked to talk about more than him. There was nothing. Well, we'd get together for family gatherings, and just before too long, our whole conversation would be about the Lord. We'd be talking about miracles we'd seen. We'd be talking about blessings. We'd be talking about answered prayer. I mean to tell you, and, and every time you'd leave feeling so encouraged and your faith was built up, my goodness, I don't mind conversations like that. So if you don't want to talk about the things of God, just don't start with me because I'll be more than happy to oblige you. In Luke chapter 12, verses 4 through 9, the Word of God declares, And I say unto you, my friends, Be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that, have no more that they can do. Well, wait a minute. Jehovah's Witnesses tell me once the body is dead, you cease to exist. So what do you mean? There's nothing more they can do. If you're dead and you just dissipated and you no longer exist, then what could anybody else do anyway? Am I telling the truth? According to Jesus, there's something that can be done to you even after you're dead. Verse 5. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Oh, so there's somebody that can do damage to you even after your body is dead. Hello now. That tells me there's life after death even for the unbeliever. That tells me there's life after death even for someone who is not in the faith and who's not walking with God. The Lord continues in verse 6, Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? Well, Lord, I don't know. I'm not up with prices from the first century. <laughs> and not one of them is forgotten before God, but even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Also I say unto you, whosoever, I love that word whosoever. You know why I love that word whosoever? Because whosoever encompasses whether you're straight, gay, cross-eyed, or blind, whether you're pretty or ugly, whether you're short or tall, whether you're skinny or fat, hello now, whosoever. Whether you're black or white, whether you speak English or Spanish, whosoever shall confess me before men. Him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before 
the angels of God. Got news for you, children, I must confess. I can't hide my faith. If somebody asks me, the Bible said, always be ready to give an answer of the hope that lies within you. Always be ready. Imagine someone today saying, I'll give you a brand new car. I just saw one online that the Toyota's come out with a new model, a new not a not a new model, but rather a new car line. They're trying to get into the ultra luxury kind of up there with Bentley and Rolls, you know. And they've created a new, it's called Century. And they've got a model that's called the GRMN. Man, you want to talk pretty. If you, I listen, folks, I'm going to tell you something. If you're looking for somebody who's trying to impress by the car you drive, you're looking at the wrong guy. I drive a, 19, a 2013 Dodge Grand Caravan, okay? So I ain't trying to impress you with my wheels. And if you're trying to be impressed by wheels, you're looking at the wrong duck. I'm the least pretentious person on the planet, which is why I think here in Dallas our church is as empty as it is, because I'm not interested in impressing you with stuff you can look at and stuff you can see. I'm interested in impressing you with substance. And if you're not impressed by substance, then I ain't interested in impressing you. If you're not more impressed with the guy behind the wheel than you are the wheels he's driving, then I don't want to know you. you. You and I aren't even on the same page. So I'm not talking about this car because it's some big luxury, you know. But I'm going to tell you, for somebody, I love, I love architecture. You know architecture qualifies as an art form? Yeah. When you go to college and you study art history, one of the things they talk about is architecture because architecture is considered an art form. And the same thing can be said of car design, automobile design. This car is so pretty. I mean to tell you, it literally looks like it has a, a, a look that just immediately brings your mind to Rolls and uh, Bentley. You know, it, it has that kind of a look. I mean, oh man, is it sharp. It is a pretty thing. Somebody come up to me and said, I'll give you one of these Toyota Century GRMN. I'll give it to you free of charge. I have one requirement. Uh, on it. There's always something. There's always something. You got to be ready to tell every person you talk to that that's the best car you've ever owned and you love it and that you ain't never driven a car like that car you're driving. That's all I got to do. That's it. That's all I got to do to have that car. Yep, that's all you got to do. <laughs> Hand me the keys. I'll tell my dog, Pepper, that is the best car I ever drove, baby. Ain't never had a better car than that, no sorry, but. See, that's an easy requirement, isn't it? See, God has offered us salvation. He has offered us eternity. And he said, the only thing is, I want you to confess me before men. I want you to pass the word. I want you to let other people know what a blessing and how wonderful that relationship you and I now have is. Because the more you talk about it, you may not, that person may not fall on their knees and repent in front of you, Bill, and want to be saved right there at that very minute. But you know what? After they've heard eight or ten people tell them that, they may decide, hmm, that, that, might be something I need to look into because my life is empty. I'm miserable. I'm a drug addict. I'm an alcoholic. I'm addicted to sex. Whatever the case might be. I'm living a miserable life and I need something to give me hope. I need something to lift me up. And I've had all these people tell me about how wonderful it is to serve God. How wonderful it is to know the Lord. Maybe I need to look into that. I saw somebody on Facebook just the last day or two wrote on his uh, post. And he said, I can't remember exactly how he worded it, but basically he said, I'm empty and I'm worn out and it's time for me to turn back to the Lord. That's what he wrote on his post. I put a big old heart on there because that's a wonderful way to go. That's a good direction to go in. But you see, 
All we have to do is be willing to talk about our faith. All we have to do is be open about our faith. That's all God asks for is that you must confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. You must believe in your heart that God hath raised Him from the dead. But listen. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. What? Righteousness isn't about my actions. It's not about what I do or how I do it. No, it's about how you believe. Hello now. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. You are made righteous by your faith in a resurrected Christ. You partake of His glorified nature. You partake of His sinless nature. You partake of His holy nature, His righteous nature, when you believe in your heart that God hath raised Him from the dead. It ain't about what you do or how you do it. What you do and how you do it affects your witness. What you do and how you do it affects your testimony. I don't want to stand here and have people say, well, the pastor said I can go out and get drunk. The pastor said I can go out and get laid. The pastor said I can go out and whore around. No, that's not what the pastor said. Your testimony and your witness is an important element to your, to your Christian walk. But as far as your salvation is concerned, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, the Word of God promises thou shall be saved. I must confess. Don't mind me, I'm moving a little slow today. Romans chapter 14 verses 11 and 12 declares, Paul writes, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord. Now mind you, mind you, Paul said, for it is written. What does that tell you? That tells you that Paul is quoting from the Scriptures. He's quoting from the Old Testament. As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Now, do you notice how God just spoke of himself in the second person? Mm -hmm. Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. That'd be like me saying, you know, everybody's going to talk to me, and everybody's going to acknowledge that Charles did thus and so. Do you follow what I'm saying? That's, that's the way he's worked. If you look in the Old Testament, you will often see that the Lord refers to himself in the second person. So why would it be unusual in the New Testament that Jesus would do the same thing? Don't make God another person. Doesn't make that another person. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? Are you, are you, you following? Hey, it's right here. Here's an example. Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us, Paul writes, shall give account of himself to God. Hmm. As I live, saith the Lord. Old Testament, this is something God said. This is something Jehovah said. In the Old Testament, where you read the word Lord, that is the same word that is often translated Jehovah. Even though Jehovah is not, to be honest, is not even an, an accurate, absolute word. Uh, it is a word that was developed by a Roman Catholic monk. He literally took vowels from one name and applied them to the consonants in the name of God that the Jews used that they had removed the vowels from because they did not want to use the name of the Lord in vain. So in order not to use the name of the Lord in vain, they removed the vowels and every time they write that name, they wrote it with the consonants only. So this brilliant monk came along and said, well, why don't we just take the uh, vowels from Adonai and put them in this, in between these, uh, you know, things. And it comes up with Jehovah. But Jehovah's not... That, there's absolutely no reason to believe that that is accurate. As a matter of fact, most Jewish uh, scholars and rabbis will tell you that it's not even remotely accurate because it, it, they, it doesn't follow the 
Hebrew pattern. It, it doesn't fit any kind of a Hebrew pattern. But anyway, uh, but that is the word Lord that you read in the Old Testament. Otherwise, it is often uh, inserted with the name of God. In other words, you know, the unspoken name, the unwritten name. Otherwise, we are familiar with the term Jehovah. So this is Jehovah God the Father saying, Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Hmm, interesting. Philippians 2, 5 through 11, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, now according to God, there is no God but He. According to God, there is no God beside Him. It says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and beside me there is no God. There is no other. So if He was in the form of God, He would have to be God, because there is no secondary God, there is no second God. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But, but's a big word, boy. But's a big word. I'm not talking about big buts, I'm talking about the word but being big. But made himself, 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 himself of no reputation. God did not make Michael the archangel into Jesus, the man. No. Bible tells us right here, he made himself of no reputation. In other words, he literally stripped himself of his reputation as God. Many of the attributes that would identify him as God, he kind of stepped out of for a moment. You follow what I'm telling you? Made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Made in the likeness of men. Are you following this? I don't have to add a lot to this because I think it's pretty plain. And being found in fashion or in design as a man, he humbled himself. He's not, he, nobody doing this to him. Nobody's humbling him. Nobody's creating him a lesser being. Nobody's creating him a servant. No, he made himself a servant. And became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Above every name. It's above Jehovah. Oh, hallelujah. It's above Adonai. Oh my goodness, have mercy. Every name they used in the Old Testament, the name Jesus is above. It is above every name. Every name. It doesn't say every name, but. Given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. That means from angels to humans to demons. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? From things in heaven to things in earth to things under the earth. Every knee is going to bow. What? At the name of Jesus, which is what? Above every name. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. Do you follow? He spoke in the first person, then he spoke in the second person. In this passage, we see the same identical thing. 
They're going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Hear, O Israel, Deuteronomy uh, 4 and 12. Hear, uh, 6 and, yeah, Deuteronomy. <laughs> Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. So when you say Lord, you're saying God. When you say God, you're saying Lord. They're one and the same. And it tells us here that one day from heaven to earth, to demons in hell are all going to bow their knee at the name of Jesus and declare that Jesus Christ is who? God. He is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. Not a separate person. But in the process of doing that, you're acknowledging what God did. You're acknowledging that God caused this man Jesus to walk planet earth so he could go to the cross, so he could go to the tomb, so he could rise again. You're acknowledging God's plan. When you call Jesus, when you acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord, what you're doing is you're giving the Father praise. You're giving, do you follow? You're giving Him the glory for this. Now, I told you before in, in our primary text today, the Word of God said, verse 13, Romans chapter 10, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, what is the name of the Lord? Well, one day every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. What is the name of the Lord? Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That's why we call him the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? You see, the difference between a believer and an unbeliever is we acknowledge him as Lord now. We ain't waiting until later. Hallelujah. I'm not going to wait till I'm facing him. I'm not going to wait until he's standing before me as God. No, I'm going to acknowledge today that Jesus Christ is Lord because I believe it's the spirit and power of God that caused him to come up, come up out of that grave. He stood before Pilate and said, I have the power to lay down my life, and I have the power to take it up again. Hallelujah. He didn't say, I'm looking for daddy to take me out of the tomb. I'm looking for daddy to raise me from the dead. No, sir. He said, I've got the power to lay my life down, and I've got the power to take it up again. Hallelujah to God. Because you can hurt this body, you can destroy this body, you can kill me, but you can't touch my spirit. And honey, the spirit you're wrestling with is the spirit you don't want to wrestle with. Because my daddy's bigger than your daddy. <laughs> Hallelujah. I must confess. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth, who? The Lord Jesus. You don't confess, confess with your mouth, Jesus. You confess the Lord, Jesus. You confess his deity. You confess his identity as God. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? That's the difference between a biblical born-again believer and somebody who's just in a church that talks about Jesus. John chapter... Excuse me, uh, 2 John, verse 7. I'm almost done, I promise. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Is come in the flesh. This implies that he existed before he came in the flesh. Hello now. He came in there. Say, if, if you're saying, oh, I don't believe so-and-so came, well, then you're implying they're coming from somewhere. They had to be somewhere before. He didn't say they are, that they're preaching that Jesus Christ is not born, that Jesus Christ was not born. That's not what he's saying. He said, there are many deceivers who are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, that God has not manifested himself in humanity. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. You wonder why I have problems with some of these cults? You wonder why I, I try to warn you about these Mormons and these Jehovah's Witnesses? 
Because they'll be the ones to tell you Jesus Christ is not God in the flesh. He is not God the Father, even though in the Old Testament the Word of God tells us His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. It's pretty simple. Even though Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He said, henceforth, from this day forward, you have not only seen Him, but you have known Him. Who? The Father. Lastly today, Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I must confess, children, we got to get our faith out of the closet we got to get our walk with God out of the closet. If you're going to stay on this boat, then you got to talk about it. There's an old song we sing, got to tell somebody what the Lord can do. Got to tell somebody what he's done for you. Uh, how he gave you victory. How he brought me through. Got to tell somebody what the Lord can do. Amen. I must confess, if I'm going to stay on this boat and be safe, if I'm going to stay on this boat and keep my place secure, I've got to confess and I've got to believe in my heart that God hath raised him from the dead. The Spirit of God has raised him from the dead. Honey, it's simple. Jesus is God. He is Lord. I confess him today. Got news for you. LGBT person, you can do it. You can do it. There is nothing in this world that prevents you from embracing and believing and obeying this gospel and staying safely in your seat until Jesus comes. Am I telling the truth today? Amen. Would you stand with me today? Amen. I love you.